started there. Everybody is muted, it looks like. All right, Don, what are we talking about tonight? We're going to talk about bees, and if uh, if people has any kind of problems uh, with their hives, now's the time to talk about it. And like I just mentioned, we're going to play teacher tonight or school. So if you don't have questions, I'm going to start calling on people and put you on the spot. So who's going to go first now? Best to volunteer now. Uh, your protege, Mr. Burns. Okay. Well, hey, Don, um, I guess we wanted to just first announce that here in uh, just a couple weeks, we'll be uh, releasing the pricing and the route for uh, delivering your bees once again up through uh, Georgia, Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. So we're excited to get more fat bee man bees uh, to more folks. We're also going to try to um, deliver uh, some fructose while we're at it, and we might make uh, two trips uh, for bees this year. So. Uh, if you want to stay up to date as to the pricing, the availability, and the route, uh, you can uh, keep in touch with us at naturesimagefarm.com, and we'll be sure to get you on the list and uh, keep you up to date. So we're excited. To, I can't remember how many years this is now. The third, third. This, this will be the third year delivering uh, your bees. Fourth year for nukes. So we're looking forward to getting those good bees to folks. So. Uh, we always appreciate what you and Steven and the whole family does, Don, for us all, and you guys do a great job on making it uh, easy and have really good bees to deliver to folks. So that really helps us build our, our little businesses too. So, so thanks for that, Don. And if people need to order bees, my suggestion is get them orders in early because there's been problems with bees all over the country. And I talked to Steven yesterday, and he's already got about four large orders. And Greg has probably seen or even been there when we have what we call large orders. And we're kind of limited to about 500 to maybe 1,000 packages on a week. But I don't know if we're going to be able to do every single week. We might have to do every other week. So uh, my history of delivering packages and is out there, and the problem that – a lot of people have is, I'm not going to mention competitors, but there's people who will take your money and they can't deliver the bees or they'll come up with some excuse. Uh, my reputation is out there. If I take your money and tell you a date, unless I die or the weather's really bad, you know, you'll get your bees. So I'm not taking orders that I can't fill. And as it looks right now, we're probably going to have about 200, maybe 250 overwintered nukes. And those are going to be with deposits or paid, and they're going to be on a limited basis. So if you're students and you need them, that's the time to get them. And we're going to be offering the two-pound packages and the three-pound packages. And if you're getting queens extra with them, be sure to let Stephen know because I don't know how many he's going to be able to pull because we're pulling for packages this year and some extras because a lot of people buy maybe 50 or 100 packages and they'll buy an extra 50 or 75 queens. So uh, that's just kind of a heads up on the whole thing. So uh, we need to get those deposits in because we don't overbook. So if we take an order, we need a deposit so we know that you're coming and we hold them unless weather or something, you know, is – you know, but we might have good early weather and get a little bit out early this year. So uh, that's where I, I think I'll mention, you know, uh, I hope somebody else has got some good questions here. Okay, first up is uh, Christine and Paul Bunyan. Go ahead, Christine. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you so much, Don. The, the videos that you put out are amazing and have been just a godsend for this um, new beekeeper. I've, I've uh, only been doing it for about four years. But my question is, I got into a hive uh, box that's normally pretty mellow, um, and they were all over me. And it was kind of like, I didn't have the, added, the right frame of mind or attitude to continue with it. So I kind of put the top super back on and said, you know, I'll deal with it another day kind of thing. Um, and I'm wondering if they get defensive. Well, I have sugar syrup in there. So I was wondering if maybe that was why they were super 
you know, were they defending against robbing for that at that point when I took their, you know, top super off and I was, I was actually checking to see if I needed to fill the feeder or if I needed to um, take the feeder out and just put a couple of empty frames in in its place or whether here and, and they just got angry and they were all over me and I wasn't feeling it. So I put the box back on and said, I'll do it tomorrow kind of thing. So I'm wondering if they get pretty defensive. Where are, where are you at? I'm in extreme Northern California on the coast and it's like, it's been really warm here. It's like 75, 78 degrees. It gets down to about 48, 52 in the, you know, at night, but that's only for a couple of hours. It's really mild. Are you having any type of a honey flow now? No, we, but we have plenty of pollen right now. We've got lots Are of pollen. Pollening? Yeah, lots of pollen. You probably have a honey flow. There's probably something out there blooming that you don't, you know, know or see. But okay. uh, how high off the ground is your hive? Um, about two and a half feet. I have them up on posts, on stands. Have you looked up underneath them and see if you've got any kind of critters under there? Yes, I have. I, I've got screen bottom boards and um, I, I do actually kind of regularly look under there to take the cobwebs out and stuff because I can get wax moth problems. I've got spiders. I, you know, just about everything. Well, the screen bottom board is not going to cause your, your wax moth problem, you know, really. Uh, normally, when you get in hives that are a little bit irritable like that, we got geckos and lizards over here, and sometimes you get uh, praying mantises will hang around the side, or you can have some European hornets. Now, they'll set a hive off, but as far as, you know, if you're feeding them inside, unless you've got a leaking feeder or something that's getting them on the ground, I don't see that you'd have you know, much of a robin problem. Um, unless the queen, you, uh, do you wear a veil and gloves when you go in there? I, I, I do. I wear everything because I swell up pretty good if I get stung. And I still usually get stung, you know, like once every other inspection somewhere. When you go to inspect it, are you smoking the entrance before you open the hive? I actually don't have the patience for smoke. But the next time I go into that hive, I'm definitely going to smoke from the top, not the entrance. Okay. That's uh, actually on my fat bee man notes from a couple weeks ago. <laughs> not to smoke the entrance. I take notes. <laughs> well, I mean, if some people take a lot of notes, you know, it's hard to keep up with everything because, you know, the weather will have a little something to do with it, but they shouldn't. Uh, the reason I ask if you wore a full bee suit is sometimes if you're not paying attention and you're wearing gloves, sometimes your fingers is hanging over the edge of a frame and you, maybe you bump the queen that you didn't see. Especially if a hive is pretty strong and you've got a lot of bees in there, you could bump a queen. That would cause them to get a little bit irritable. Well, they were, they were pissed off as soon as I took the um, inner cover off. Uh, well, I don't run inner covers because normally, I, you know, we got rid of those like 45 years ago, but that's just an individual preference. Usually when you have inner covers, you're going to have ants, roaches, and, and beetles, all kinds of stuff up there because it's uh, another place just for the bees to, uh, to run them up to. Okay. Have you got fire ants over there? Probably no. do. We don't have beetles, uh, we don't have hive beetles, and we don't have fire ants. We do have wax moths, and we do have mites. Well, the wax moths are only going to come from a weak hive. So, you know, uh, when people tell me they looked in their hive one day, and then they go back next week, and it's just full of webs and that, they didn't go all the way down in the box. And, you know, it, it takes about three weeks before you start getting a lot of webbing and that in there. Yeah. Now, if you get hives out, you know, that just jogged my memory about wax moth. If you get hives that are dead outs, best thing to do is just leave the lid off the hive until you can get back to work it, you know, work with your wax in that. If the hive is open, it's not closed up, the wax moths don't usually reproduce in there. Okay. I, I melt my stuff down if I have dead outs and stuff. I, we melt it down because I go in with new wax constantly. I want good foundation in there and, and keep it going good. Okay. But I would check underneath. Uh, more than likely, you have something under there. Now, you could go in that hive uh, 
on a sunny day, you know, the next couple of days and pull the center frame out and just turn your back to the sun and look in there and see if you've got white milk. If you've got white milk in the cells, you've got to clean in your land and just kind of glance at it and see if you've got a good pattern there, if it's just kind of spotty. Well, I, I went in there two weeks, uh, two weeks ago and I definitely had eggs and larvae. So, I mean, I, I, from at that point she was in there and she was doing a, a job. I just wondered if they ever got defensive over having the feed in there. Like, Not necessarily because we run some inside feeders on our production hives. We have inside feeders, but a lot of our hives we run buckets on so we don't have to get in and out of that hive, you know. Thank you. Okay. I hope that helps you out a little bit there. Yeah, I will look for praying mantis because that is something we would have. I would think there. you have something there that's agitating the bees. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, over to Pat. Go ahead, Pat. Hi, everybody. Um, this was for Christine. I don't use a lot of smoke because it flares up my allergies. Um, in the summertime, when the temperatures are above 70 and it's a warm, sunny day, I've got a spray bottle that's a quart size spray bottle, and I take a half a bottle of the liquid smoke that you use in your kitchen and put in there and shake it up real good and miss the bees with that. The smoke smell is what you're after and it works real well and you don't have to breathe the heavy smoke from the smoker. If it's colder than 70 though, light your smoker and suck it up because you don't want wet bees in cold weather. That's all. I think Don puts it on his hands, don't you Don? Once in yeah, a while. If you, uh, I keep a bottle out here, it's a, like a two ounce bottle. You just put a drop or two on your hands and just rub your hands together like you would, you know, for soap and that, um, and the smell of it. And I've even worked my highs with new students out here with a smoker that's been out for a day or two and just blow a little of the air across them and the smell just usually calms them down. Okay. Uh, over to David and Tracy. Go ahead, guys. Hey, good evening, Don. How are you doing? Hey, um, just a couple questions um, for the the uh, bucket feeders that you put on top. We, we put in Clorox in the the sugar water solution two to one and uh, it keeps pretty well after about a week or so you'll start to get some mold um, in there uh, we don't fill them full we just fill them maybe a half full or so is there anything else that we can do to kind of prevent the mold from occurring i've done a video on using uh, tea tree oil which is antibacterial antifungal and we mix that in with our syrup and uh that way you can go with a little bit thinner syrup and it won't mildew on you. Oh, perfect. Oh, that's a great tip, okay. And, and the other question is, uh, we just got through with um, an extraction of honey here this week and the cappings, uh, how would you suggest that we get them cleaned out? Uh, I assume some, some distance away from the hives, but how, do you, how would you normally have them clean that up? Well, what amount are we talking about? Lots of it's probably three, yeah, it's probably three or five gallon buckets full of wax cappings. Well, the, the one way we done before, you know, we don't do it all the time, but on small batches, you can put it in like a Tupper made Tupperware container. It's like a 20 or 30 quart and get yep. some rabbit wire and lay across the top. That way, if the bees get a lot of wax stuck to them, it'll knock it off and you won't lose your wax. Oh. Another thing with that volume there is you can add a little water to a pot and slowly bring it up to everything melts and then just set the bucket in, you know, inside somewhere and let it cool off. Pull that block of wax out and then you take that there, it's liquid uh, honey with water in it and you just feed it direct to the bees. That way you don't cause robbing. It's, it's another way. There's a lot of ways to take care of it. Uh, okay, I've so seen people you, just put cappings outside, but it causes loving. Yeah, that's that's right. I, we were kind of worried about that for sure, but that's a good suggestion. Do you, do you put the like the the honey solution or honey water solution in a bucket feeder or in a hive top feeder? You can use either way. We okay. usually just put it in a bucket and let them. Put, you know, in fact, in the winter time, a lot of times we open up quarts of honey or five gallon buckets of honey. And on our one gallon feeders, we'll use a third of a bucket or a half a bucket and put them to them. 
It's just awesome. recycle honey. Okay. No, it's good. Hey, and just a word of thanks. Uh, it's been a great successful year for us because of you and, and uh, everything that we've been taught and all the chats and the, the folks here online have been awesome. So thanks yeah. very much from uh, Heppel White Farms. Well, get, get yourself uh, set up so you can sell you know, your nukes and your queens and stuff because the market, I give someone your name the other day, they called from uh, North Dakota or South Dakota and they wanted some bees in the springtime. I said, well, get them for one of my students that you got students all over the place. Get on my list there and, and check down to who you got them from. So if you're that's a student awesome. and you're registered on my page, that's one way you don't have to advertise. And it's a marketing tool. Take advantage of it. Well, we started out with just probably 10 nukes. So we're at 200 now. And so we're ready for spring sales and we're ready to, to continue moving, moving forward. So thanks for all the great uh, help. Build more boxes. It springs around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. If you've got All right, thanks, nukes, uh, you know, we've advertised ours for 250 I mean, you can sell them for what you want, but people that want overwinter nukes, uh, we mark them to 250 and our spring nukes, which we start making them up at the end of February in March, those are 175 And you might want to take and build some five-frame boxes, you know, for like chipping boxes. Just build them mm -hmm. 10 inches high and put a solid piece of paneling in the bottom and one on the top. Uh, there's people that will come and buy five or 10 nukes and they say your bees are so gentle, they always want more and they don't have boxes. And yeah. we don't like to use the cardboard because the cardboard boxes, they shift around and you end up squashing a queen or you damage the box. Uh, and you can always, as a selling point, charge 25 bucks and tell them you can use it as a swarm trap afterwards. True. Sure. That's you know, a good so point. Take good advantage of all of that. Yeah, we'll, we'll do. Okay. Great. Well, thanks again, Don. Thanks, everybody. Okay. No other questions in right now. Get those hands up, people. Oh, uh, uh, David's got one. Yep. Doesn't look like David, though. Yeah, yeah he's hiding. <laughs> Get on mute it. Mute. There you go. Okay. No, it's I. I didn't know how to tape Dave's name off and put my name on. It's Nancy. Hi, Don. How are you doing? Hi. We've been so busy and having so much fun with the bees. This is our first weekend off that I've had a chance to get on on the video chat here. Yeah, we have yeah. really enjoyed it. It's been a lot of fun. Now we made we had um we had some queen cells and we got some extra boxes. We lost some from the hive beetles. Um, I think we got we lost two from wasp, so we've dealt with different situations throughout the summer, but we got a handle on everything. We we finally got them all ready for for the winter. I asked um, I called Dennis in Missouri, and he mm -hmm. helped me a couple of times. So mm -hmm. we're having a lot of fun. Thank you. Well, are you uh, getting ready to go full strength on this business? Um. Let's see, we're gonna build up our numbers. Okay. We have 30 right now and we're gonna build up our numbers. And um, oh yeah, um, my grandson, Donovan, you remember him and my brother, Donald. Yeah, they're, um, well, Donald's unemployed. So yeah, he's ready to go full time. Um, Donovan helped us all summer long. And, but we just need to cut more trees, put more tables down. Mm -hmm. We don't have no space, so we need to, clear out some of our land and get some tables set this winter. Getting on these pads yeah. is the best way to promote your bees. Uh, and then, you know, try to get your numbers up before you start selling, if, if at all possible. You know, some people oh. are just, you know, put so much in, they have to get so much out because they think it's a one-way deal. So the main thing is get your numbers up before you start selling and don't, yeah. don't run, you know, specials or cut prices on it right now. Bees are getting harder and harder to get with all the problems the United States has got everywhere. Yeah. Well, we had, I have a funny story to tell you. When I was at Menards, you know that video that they shot of when we put the packages in that box? Mm -hmm. Remember that? Yeah. Well, I showed it to a guy that, that works at Menards, and his jaw just dropped. He couldn't believe how I could be standing there with that swarm of bees all around me. And I had that bee on my cheek and, you know, he couldn't believe it. And he says, the, last, the only thing he said is, I want your bees. 
Well, see, that's a selling point. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. <laughs> that's a selling point. And, you know, you're never going to yeah. build enough boxes. So now's the time to get the boxes going in the springtime, you know. Yeah. Well, but we're thinking about buying some queens from you just to get us a, a good head start for the spring. So. Well, you know, Dennis is not too far from you. Now, you probably could drive over there if he's going to have a bunch of extra cells. That's. You know, you could go in there with mated queens, or you could go in there with cells. If you've got enough stock there, you know, I mean, there's different ways to build them numbers up, but get your numbers up a little bit. Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, because I, I think we're going to be swamped once we start selling, because um, I people have been finding out that we have bees, and they, they want them, and I just keep telling them that we're not ready yet to sell. I mean, we're still on the tricycle. We might get on the training wheels next year. <laughs> I mean, we have to learn what we're doing first. So, well, you know, I keep telling people, you know, it's hard work. There's a learning curve to it, but you know, being self-employed and making the you know, sky's the limit. You can make what you want. If you want to work long hours, you can make it. You know. Oh yeah. Did you want? And everything I, I try to teach is simple. It's, it's common sense stuff. Yeah, yeah, it it is, and you you can really um. You can really start overthinking. And I keep telling everybody, I keep bringing Donald, my brother, back down to earth. I said, is it in a tree? Because Don says, if it's not in a tree, we don't need it. <laughs> I, I keep telling him that over and over because he wants to keep doing everything more and more. And it's like, no, we don't need that because Don says, it's not in a tree. We don't need it. Well, there's so. a lot of them out there that are just gimmicks. I mean, keep it. Well, do we lose Don? I, I think so. I, I think he I just froze up. Don, uh, just hold on. He'll come back. <laughs> okay. Maybe. Yeah, oh, we're thank all you still for here. teaching my name. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> Hi, Pat. Okay. Don, come on. <laughs> I, I did have one question for Don. But... Well, let's see if he makes it back. Greg might be on the spot now. Do you still have another question, Nancy? Yes. Um, I was watching one of the chats um, the other day, and Ernest was talking about down the drain. I'm not really quite for sure what he meant by that. And he said he really liked it. It was really easy for him. Um, Greg, you want to explain that a little bit? There you go. There's Don. He's back. Oh, there he is. Let me get on mute you down. I guess we must have had a power surge or something. Oh, okay. Um, Nancy was just asking, she wants to know about what down the drain means. Down the drain is one way we use to just shake a frame and spot your queen. You pick a frame up and go through the high pretty quick. If you don't spot the queen, you reverse the lid upside down with a hole in the center of it. And when you give it a shake, all the bees go down the hole. That's why I call it going down the drain. Uh, I've shown okay. it to several students, and they think that's the best thing since sliced bread. Okay, and that's a good way to spot the queen. Okay. Right. It's just All another right. another tool to use. I'll try that next year. He's got a video of that on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll look for it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All Dennis, right. you're going to tell us what's going on up there now. I said I'm going to be school teacher tonight and pick students. All right. Can you hear me? Yep. Well, Nancy, it's good to see your face, and I know who I'm talking to. Uh, right now, I'm preparing for winter, and we've got some nights get down to 32, 33. This summer kind of got set back a little bit because I had my dad pass away, so I took some of his business, uh, kind of took over some of the business. So uh, me and Greg was talking about how many full-size hives in order to have some what we call it uh working material i think all mine all exception about 50 nukes the rest of them's in full size high so next year i'll just have more more resources to work with so mm -hmm. looking forward to it except you got me so busy this way i just don't have a hard time I missed the chat last week's too tired to, or a week before it's too tired to get on here this bees will kill you <laughs> well, you can make money at it i mean yeah. there's a lot of people that have a lot of naysay about everything and I hear all over the internet people say, if you want to make a million, you've got to invest 10 million. 
I've got students all over the United States in many different areas that make money the very first year, you know. So you don't make money, live, you know. I've made money. I had to kind of keep it. I had to slow it down because I like money. <laughs> I'll sell everything out. But I sold all the queens I wanted to this year. Right. I had no problems. I think we're in our third or fourth year. I forgot which now as far as bees. And all I can say is give your customers the best mm -hmm. and they'll come back. And I've had, I've got a lot of return business. So it's been good. You know, for the $500 to be a, a student, it, it, you spend that in a month or a week's time advertising. And being a student and getting on these chats, you can't buy that much advertising, believe me. Well, they keep a calling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I have a lot of them call me, and Nancy's one of them, and several of them call me for information. I, I like doing that, passing on what you've taught. And, and uh I didn't have that kind of help when I was growing. Me when neither. I first started, I, the commercial guys wouldn't ever talk to you. They act like you had to plug or something. So I had to learn a lot of stuff the hard way. So I figured, hey, pass it on. Maybe mm -hmm. there'll be some more beekeepers stay after it that way. That, that's what I'm bending over backwards. People think I got a lot of patience, but I, I remember what I went through when I was a teenager and just getting started in the bees. And the, yeah. the crap that people tell you that won't work, they know it won't work, but they don't want you to be successful. I want my students to be successful, and I actually, I send them business. I don't want any more business. I got all I can handle. Can't do but so much. Well, I appreciate it, Don. You're welcome. Okay, we got a question from Matt. Go ahead, Matt. Unmute it. Here you go. Can you hear me now? Yep, you're on. All right, uh, I, got a, I got a question. I got some some uh, extra cone and stuff. Uh, how do I, can I store that and it not go bad? Well, if you're going to store comb, you're going to either have to put it on some type of chemical or you're going to have to open store it and you can crisscross your boxes. Every box, put it at 180 from the box underneath it and keep a light on in there. That's supposedly going to keep wax moth down from it, but it's not a, you know, a cure-all. You can buy the wax, uh, Wax moth protection, paramoth, I believe they sell, but I don't like putting stuff in the hive because in the boxes because it absorbs into the wax. The wax yeah. is like a sponge. So to me, it's the same thing as your fingernails. They grow year round. Bees are making wax, you know, all the time. So I want new wax in there as much as I possibly can. So it's a personal preference the way you want to store. Yeah. Well, if it's got honey in it, you can't store it that way, right? Well, if you store frames with honey in it, you're going to get whack uh, beetles in it. They'll start to slime up on you. And you could put it in a freezer, but I don't want to go out and buy about 40 or 50 commercial freezers. So if I have honey, I'll pull it and put it in buckets or I'll put it in barrels. You know, so to, I'll refeed as much of it as I possibly can. Well, if you get up there and extract the honey out of it, then will it store? It'll store Harder. if you extract the honey and don't leave any comb in it. But you they know, still let it through a filter or skim off that wax particles, and and if you have any pollen particles in it, try to get that out. Okay. The pollen is basically an yeast and will cause it to ferment, or let yeah. the bucket settle for you know about a week, then skim it. Okay. So in other words, it'd really be best if you had the part one that had the honey in, in the freezer. If you could freeze it, but you know, you know, you're talking to people that have four or five hives can do it, but you're running four or five hundred or four and five thousand, it's it's a whole different story. Yeah. Well, like I said, I told you before, I ain't got the seventy hives, but now I ain't got that many cones. I've got probably about thirty mm -hmm. that I've got here that that I could use in the spring, you know, I hate them to do it. And I ain't got but about five or six that's got honey in it. Well, so you it can try the paramoth. I mean, there's people that do use it. I mean, it's strictly, you know, your preference. Yeah. All right. Oh, uh, well, my next question is, I've, I'm switching over using the bucket feeders. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about, you know, venting them. Uh, and you said you're drilling holes right underneath the handle. Well, we um, use a, a, a one-gallon bucket, and we drill the lid out and put a plug in it. It's a plug. It's about an inch and five-eighths, somewhere yeah, in that area. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. 
Yeah. But I was wondering, how are you venting the box? You don't need, oh, oh the, the box itself? Yeah, the box itself. Oh, we've been putting an inch and a quarter or an inch and an eighth hole in the front underneath the handhold and one in the back under the handhold. And then if you're okay. running a spacer on top, you can run sp uh, feeder uh, vents in that too. But uh, we basically just run a front and back vent. And then put hardware cloth across it, number eight hardware cloth. Yeah. If there's too much ventilation, they'll just propolize it shut. Well, see, I'm building my own boxes, and my handles is middle ways of the box. So you're talking about your vent hole is going to be lower than that, right? Well, I don't know what type of handles. I use a rabbit on mine, and mine are three inches from the top. So if you put your hands around the hive, your fingers are going that slot near the handhold, and if you put that hole above it, you're going to get it in your palm, a stinger. So we put ours three inches, our hand holds, and then we put the vent hole below that so you don't get stung in your palm of your hand. Yeah. So basically your vent holes are around five inches down from the top, something in that line. About four, four and a half, you know. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Oh, that's all I got for right now. There's okay. something else. I can't think of what it was right at the moment. All right. Okay, I think Greg wants to add on to that a little bit. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, it was just a, actually it was a kind of, of a follow-up question to Matt on the, the saving of the frames. What, what I learned from Don was I know a lot of folks put a lot of emphasis and value on saving their wax uh, and going through um, all the aggravation uh, to preserve it so they can use it in the spring. Uh, and so I don't know what if you've had the experience, Matt, one way or the other, on saving that to see if you are finding value in it as well. But, um, you know, it, I, maybe my experience is just an outlier ex experience, uh, or maybe it's, you know, in line with like what, what Don sees, but uh, it's, it almost seems like it's more of an aggravation to try to preserve uh, that foundation to use in the spring. What I've seen now for years uh, and years in a row is if I try to um, put that, that foundation uh, in the hive in the spring, a lot of times those early bees, they're in such a hurry to draw fresh white wax, so it kind of sets them back. They'll draw, they'll draw it on the lid, they'll draw it on the side, they'll try to draw it in between, or they'll even double comb it to get that fresh white wax so that queen can get laying. So it probably has to do with context on what you're trying to use it in. Now, if it's a package and you put maybe one of those in, um, I've tested it now for a few years in a row and I, it, I still can't believe that I keep seeing it, but I'll put in that foundation that I save and then I'll put in a starter strip or I'll just put in a regular frame and those bees go like gangbusters and they'll draw out that, that entire frame um, all, either with nothing on it or just a starter strip. They'll draw that whole entire thing out before they even try to go back in and clean up that old foundation. So um, I just wanted to throw that out there just to, you know, if, maybe figure out what your goals, uh, what that foundation actually is. But um, sometimes you end up throwing money away because you can, like what Don does, is just cut all that wax out, melt it down, turn it into wax bricks, and then have something that you can then turn in into fresh foundation in the spring or other um, you know, value add products. But um, so maybe just experiment. Uh, if you have less than 500 frames that you're trying to preserve, uh, we have done it. And we just hang them up in the rafters uh, in the workshop where it gets light and it gets sun constantly. Uh, hang them up just open air, just by take a two by four uh, and run that through uh, your table saw with a three quarter inch dado right down the center and it just makes little racks kind of like this that hangs up and then the frames just you know slide in. That's one way to do it. Um, that works, but um, you know, just I would say experiment a little bit in the spring. Uh, and if you find that it's not really helping you or it's giving you the advantage that if some folks say they have, man, you might just melt it down and, and do something else with it. So just want to throw that, that, that idea out there. Well, there's a lot of people that, you know, you hear a lot of junk from everybody and a lot of people say cones value, but if, I understand if they'll get in there and, and jump in there and build fresh cone, they naturally going to want that first. So basically y'all saying I need to just melt that down and use the wax. You, you have to kind of go with your judgment, what you do. And, you know, there's like you just said, there's so many opinions out there. 
and I sometimes I wonder if I'm boring people because I repeat myself so much. I always tell people, if you're taking advice, ask the people, are you doing this part-time, full-time? Do you make a living at it? You know, just because you're a master beekeeper and they got two hives that they're proud of with seven boxes high and buy new hot bees every year, I mean, take advice from people who's sharing it that make money with it, you know, that are successful. That's all I can, you know, keep preaching to you. There's yeah. a lot of people that's, to me, it, you know, stacking boxes that high, it's like antlers on the wall. Once you get your wall full of antlers, you're done bragging. Now you throw them out to the, throw them out to the dump. You know? Yeah. What works and it's reasonable to keep up. That makes sense. I understand that. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I'm trying to get into it as a business, and uh, so I'm trying to listen to y'all and see what I actually need to do. And and if y'all saying it's better just to melt it down, then I'll just melt it down. It ain't no big deal. You know, it's I I tell people all the time, if I have a student out there and they're standing next to me and you ask them a question. You know, they're not going to tell you the truth. But right here is an opportunity. When I'm off this chat, there's an after chat. People, they could say, I hate the guy. He's just obnoxious. Whatever they want to say, they're going to tell you the truth. You know, and I'm not, I'm here to educate you. I'm not here to sell you a thing. I, I don't need to sell you nothing. I mean, there's there's books out there. You know, say well, I'm I'm not, I know I'll listen you. I've listened to a lot of your videos and everything that I've tried that you said it's worked. So I can't, I can't knock nothing you've said so far uh, that I've tried. So if y'all say it melt it down, they'll, they'll make their own wax and use it better than what I would have for next year. Then I'll just melt it down and need wax anyway to put on my uh, foundation for next year. So, all right. All right, over to Christine. Go ahead, Christine. Yeah, um, my question is kind of piggybacking off my my angry hive that I had earlier. Um, but I, I only have three colonies and I'm feeding them all pretty heavily um, with syrup right now because I was under the impression that we were in a dearth up here. We've got plenty of pollen coming in but all the blackberries are gone and um, mass plantings and stuff as far as I know are gone. So um, my question is that I was feeding syrup in the hopes of building up lots of comb and encouraging brood for winter bees. Um, and they're putting it all in the honeycomb pretty fast. And so Am I just being redundant here? Um, am I wasting my time feeding them? Should I just let them do their own thing and then wait until you know they run out of stores and then start feeding them? I'm just trying to build up good numbers for the winter. And um, let's see, do I even need to still keep feeding, I guess is my question. The queen's laying good, they're building up numbers, but they're storing, it seems like they're storing almost all that syrup. I mean, I don't know if they're storing it all and using the excess for resources, but am I wasting my time or should I put another box on and let them store some more? <laughs> That's my question. And did Don leave again? <laughs> Don, don't leave me. It's that, Christine, it's every time you're on, you talk to him, he, he disappears. I don't know what. See if you make the pack, I guess. Well, they can wait. They can wait. <laughs> All right. Might have to put Greg in the hot seat again. Paul, welcome back. Hey, how you doing, E? Good, and you? Where have you been? All right. I've been busy working in the pole barn, trying to get that sheetrock. And... <laughs> it's not a pole barn. It's a bee barn. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> I already need another one. Oh, geez. Keep building them like Greg has. Hey, but getting back to Matt's question, Greg can probably help me out on this one. Okay. You know, I, I have I find it hard to switch out uh, my brood my brood comb because I'm I'm using a deep for the brood chamber, and then I'm using mediums as my supers, and I just you know how do you switch those combs out, Greg? Do you I don't know what to do with the frame full of brood. 
you switch them out, you mean to, to save them, to use them in the spring or as you go throughout the year? No, like your old uh, comb that's been in there for two or three years. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's another selling point for just melting everything down is that you don't have to try to, to put that back in the hive in the spring. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I really prefer myself uh, running mediums, but like Don's mentioned, you know, there's a lot of folks want to buy d uh, deep nukes. Um, so I end up running both, which is becomes an aggravation. Um, I guess it's, you know, you probably heard me say uh, and beat the dead horse where, you know, it context is key on something like that. Um, so in, in my context, I'm running very little to no honey. Uh, so I'm basically running just brood chambers um, with a little bit of storage on top. So I really don't have much of that to uh, even try to work through. Um, so it's mostly all, uh, you know, occasionally I'll get, uh, if I'm stacking them up early, you know, I might get uh, a, an upper box that might be heavy in drones before it gets heavy um, in honey. And so when I have manipulated that and used that around, um, you know, it's, it's as silly as it sounds, I have seen bees just, they'll rework a frame too, if that's what they've got to work with. Um, so um, the, trying to save, you know, your super found you know your your frames that were, were supers save those for the spring to put them back in there i don't know that it, it's it, and for my context that just becomes more of an aggravation yeah i don't even save the brood wax i tell you by the time you get through all of those cocoons not and everything left, is there no I, it's not even worth it i save my cappings wax and that's the best wax there is yep you know all right, thanks, Greg. Yeah. Okay, Christine, maybe you have you can ask Greg your question. Um, so, Greg, my question was, um, I'm feeding, you know, a thick, like peach canned syrup <laughs> to the bees to try to get them to build up numbers. I did replace the queen because um, I had a queenless colony. I replaced her at the very end of August. She's laying like a mad lady. I love it. Um, but they're putting, I think they're putting all the syrup into comb and storing it. So am I wasting my time? Should I keep feeding or should I just stop feeding? Like Don said, he thinks we might have a honey flow, but I, I really honestly don't know for sure. I mean, but I just don't want to keep feeding them and, you know, worrying about, uh, you know, re replenishing their feeders if they're just putting it into comb and like, do I need to add another box and let them make more stores of the sugar syrup? <laughs> Got any advice? Yeah, where, Christine, where, where are you located? I'm on the coast of Northern California. Northern California. Uh, so maybe Todd uh -huh. Prater could, he might be able to chime in. I'm, I'm not familiar at all with the, the nuances in Northern California. Uh, I would assume you guys aren't even going to be flirting with 30 and 40 degree weather for probably another month and a half. No, we were like, it was 78 degrees today. Yeah. and It got down last night was 48. I mean, it you know, it cools off at night really good, but it warms right up during the day and there's like no rain in sight, no frost in sight. I'm just, we pretty much keep feet on year round. Um, for me here in Ohio, uh, it's dipping down into 32. I've switched to fructose, which is going to be thicker than the peach syrup, um, but it, it, it affords you some flexibility with temperature swings and such. Um, but I keep that on pretty much. And again, context is key. I'm, I'm not in the honey business. Um, so any hives that I am trying to get honey off of, um, those ones aren't on full feed. Everything else is on full feed so they can get as big and healthy as they can. Um, and for me, it's, it's my opinion, it's probably Don's as well. If the hive wants the store, uh, some of that heavy syrup or some of that fructose uh, and it's not a hive that you're producing honey why not let them uh, yeah. put that but what you'll probably notice and, and Don he, Don's back he can chime in on that if you have if you have feed on them and they have a flow uh, Don's talked about and he has videos they'll bypass the feed and they'll go they'll go for the nectar source and start bringing that in so by having the feed on there it just gives them the opportunity where if you uh, get lucky enough up in California to get a couple days of rain uh, and the bees are hemmed up inside the box, they've got feed, you know, so they're not going to be, they're not going to have any downtime. 
Don, her, her question was, uh, she, she, she's up in Northern California uh, and she's wondering if it's okay to keep the feed on uh, through its, it's the, the, the temps are in the seventies. Uh, she might, she thinks the bees might be putting some of the, uh, that feed um, in the cells. Uh, do you have any advice on whether or not to feed or not feed? Uh, his audio still hasn't connected yet. He's really slow. He's still offline there. Yeah, partially. Todd, what are you doing up there in Northern California? Are you, Todd? Where are you at? I'm central. I'm central. central. She she's kind of in a different climate, I guess. Christine, are you like up around Crescent City? I'm I've got about the same climate as Crescent City. We're okay. a mile south of that. So, like what Greg said, if um, if, if there's a nectar flow, they'll bypass. The, the food um, or whatever you put out to feed them. Um, same with, um, you know, like if you had to put a pollen feeder out somewhere, they'll bypass that if there's real pollen. So uh, I'm not really doing anything different than that. I mean, um, you know, if they're low on feed and, and um, I need to know if they, uh, are out of a nectar flow or if we're in a dearth, I put a little honey on the entrance like in one of Don's videos. And then if they start chowing down on it, then I know that there's nothing coming in. Well, they're using, they're, they're sucking the syrup dry. They're, they're using it pretty, you know, they're a gallon within, you know, maybe nine days. And so, but I think they're putting it all in, I think they're storing it all. I, I think, but my goal was to build, not for honey, I'm not going to take that syrup and make, and, you know, use mm -hmm. the honey out of it. I'm, it's just for the bees. And my goal is to build numbers for the winter to, you know, keep my hive, my colony strong. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I would say, you know, if, if they're taking the feed, give it to them. The only problem you might run into up there is you might plug the queen up and then she has no place to lay. So you kind of have to monitor what, how much they're, you know, if they're putting the, the syrup in the brood nest, um, you might want to slow down on it. Or, or should I add another box? I, I wouldn't add another box. If I had to, what I'd do is I'd take a couple of the outside frames out, put them in a freezer, and then uh -huh. use those to feed bees in the spring maybe, or maybe the same hive. I, you know, and then put, you know, replace it with two frames so they have a place to, to put the feed. I like that. Thank you. I like that. Okay. Well, uh, Don's still trying to connect here. Don't look like he's got any audio yet. So, Pat, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I did for Christine. Um, nectar flow ends when the nighttime temperatures are warm enough that you can go outside with no shirt on comfortably. So if those t nighttime temperatures are in the high 60s, low 70s, you're still in nectar flow. Once they go above 70, you're probably not in nectar flow. But the one thing that you really need to do is an inspection on that bottom box because if like one of the other guys said, if they're putting honey in the brood area, the queen has nowhere to lay, they're going to abscond, which means all the bees leave instantly together. Mm -hmm. um, it's, not, it's not a swarm, it's, they just all leave because she has to physically lay. If there's nowhere for her to lay, she, she makes them all leave and make a new place to live. So you need to go into that bottom box and see what's going on. If you find that there's a lot of stores everywhere, back off on how often you're feeding. If you're just trying to get them full enough for winter, um, you know, do y'all get really cold winters there? Or <laughs> no, not really. We'll we'll yeah. get we'll get a few days at a time where it's you know the 29, 28 degrees. Um, if you call that cold. I know some of you guys get really cold, but uh, yeah, it'll, <laughs> yeah, I think it'll... you're more like what we have out here on the East Coast, kind of. Um, so you're, you're just trying to get them through the winter in a healthy state. As long as they um, have a box full of nectar or honey or food that you're feeding them, they're fine. You really need to do that inspection and see what's going on in that bottom box. Not, the, not so much the top box, 
see what's in the bottom box. And like they said, pull out some honey frames, give her some room in the bottom box so that she can keep on laying. Um, make sure that you've done your mite treatment. That's really important to get yes. them through the winter. Yes. The bees right now are the ones that are gonna live all through the winter. They live longer because they don't have as much work to do. So okay. you wanna make sure that your mite count's good there. Um, and then when you get in the really cold periods, um, you might consider taking off the liquid and putting on some dry sugar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, excess liquid in the hive when it's really cold, you're going to get wet bees. Wet bees are dead bees in cold weather. So you want to monitor that real closely. Uh, look up Mountain Camp. It's a method of feeding named after some guy's uh, CB handle. And um, it's real simple. It's just pouring the dry sugar on a piece of newspaper. But uh, it's good to be informed and know what your temperatures are. Do you run solid bottom boards or screen bottom boards? I run screen, uh, screen bottom boards and okay. I, I, uh, I try to keep it ventilated. I've drilled holes mm -hmm. like Don talks about to, okay. because moisture is, because I'm coastal Northern California, mm -hmm. I understand that moisture is my biggest enemy. Yeah, and I really mine too. I have a good solid, I run screen bottom boards and I have a good solid north wind block. I have a piece of privacy fence for that. And I'm in the middle of a field, it's all my land. The privacy fence is just to block that north wind off my bees. It's about three foot on the north side of my beehives. Um, I leave my screen bottom boards open all year. A lot of people put that, that white board in. If you're gonna do that, put it in now and leave it till spring. Don't see on the news it's going to freeze and go stick that in and then see, oh, it's warming up, pull it out. You're just screwing with them every time you change what's going internally. They can adjust and make adaptation if you leave it, but if you change it every other week, they can't get used to that. So don't do that. Leave it out. I don't ever put mine in. It's still in the closet. I've never used it. Well, so. I, only, I put mine in, but I do it when I'm going to do an, uh, an oxalic acid treatment. And that That's the correct way to I use it the drops <laughs> that's that is the correct way to use it and then clean it off and off. store it yeah <laughs> and i do store my honey uh supers over the winter um i use paradichlorobenzene or paramoth um, and i have quite good success with that because i get honey in early spring and then i make splits to sell bees so i do both um and i do store I do change that out every other year so that they're always making fresh wax and I do let them make fresh wax in the brood chamber and the paradichlorobenzene does not remain in the wax. You have to air it out for about two weeks before you can use it, but it completely goes away from the cone. It does not remain in the cone. It does no harm to the bees or the larva or young bees or anything. It's no problem in the hive. Um, and I've, I've been very successful with that. I'll have to Google the Paramount thing and see how that works. Mm -hmm. you yeah, you can get it from any of the bee supply companies, Man Lake or Better Bee, you know, Dedant, any of those guys will sell it. You can also get it at Walmart. It is moth crystals. What you're looking for is that word, paradichlorobenzene. Okay, it's a long word, but just look for the P-A-R-A. Uh, do not use mothballs. They are naphthalene, and that is a deadly poison. You want the you want the para dichlorobenzene, and it works. We put them in a garbage bag and put a coffee filter on top with about a teaspoon of the para dichlorobenzene. Tie the bags up, and we check once a month. It sometimes it dissolves into the air, so and it's heavier than air, so it sinks down into the bee the boxes and um, so you have to refill it throughout the winter and then about two weeks before nectar starts I pull them out and air them out in the open and get all the fumes out and once you don't smell it anymore there isn't any in the wax so it works real well. Thank you. Okay and it looks like Don's back now. Can you hear us Don? Maybe. Hi Don. <laughs> Frozen again. We'll just have to keep Christine on mute, that's all. <laughs> and he's gone again. Oh, wait a minute. Is he back? Are you back now, Don? Yeah, the internet thing, it keeps flashing now. 
We might have to call it a night then if we keep losing Don. I had one more little thing to add. If you don't have a bee club near you, every city and county has an agricultural extension agent. It's through the federal government. You can find them in the phone book listings. They will know when your nectar flow is, or they will know who you can contact at one of the state universities that will have that information for you. It's a real good resource, agricultural extension agent. Thank All right, you. Don, are you back now? I think so. Do okay. I look like I'm back? It looks like it. Let's try to keep you for a few minutes. Um, oh. Linda Webster has a question. Go ahead, Linda. Okay, regarding the paramoth, I keep my boxes and frames in an empty 20-foot trailer, like a freight, freight liner trailer. And in the winter, it gets super, super cold in there. And does that enough to to kill everything or should I still be putting the paramoth on there? If you're using it, I would put it in the trailer. Okay. I don't, okay. Personally, I don't use it. I just, I go with new wax every year. Okay. Because if you're, if you're going to try to store, you know, several thousand frames, you're going to, have to start buying it by the five gallon buckets full. Yeah. Well, I don't have that many, but I've got a couple hundred in there and I just put them in there and it gets so cold in the winter, I thought it would be killing everything, but I haven't put the paramoth on top of it. I've taken frames apart that people's had in the freezer and pulled a lead bar out and showed them the wax small eggs and stuff under there. It'll kill the worms, but it's not gonna kill the eggs. As soon as the temperature comes up, the eggs seem to hatch. Okay. All right, I have the paramoth. I'll, I'll, I'll start using it. Okay. Thank and you. Over to Ernest. Go ahead, Ernest. You got unmuted, Ernest. Okay. Good there you go. Fun and good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to mention to Paul there. Uh, you can make some nice wax with these solar melders. To, uh, I made one, I think Mr. Zirkel made one, and uh, uh, made some real nice uh, wax. Uh, it looks like uh, capping wax. And that was one thing. The other thing is uh, I put a fence up for uh, uh, the bears, and uh, I went up there today, and something had got into it. I didn't have a camera up, but whatever it was, they'd got a hold of that wire and, and broke the fence down, and uh, the Fence was still working, so uh, I don't know where I, I, I kept a bear from getting in there, or maybe a deer got into it. But he might want to rub his horns on it and found out that didn't work. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, uh, the electric fence is uh, a good security thing. And I've been propping my highs up. That's one thing I've started my winter uh, uh, thing. I put an inch uh, drop uh, on the back of them. Uh, I'd raise them up one inch because uh, you get a blowing rain or blowing snow. Uh, I went up there once and the uh, hive was about level and the whole bottom was covered with bees trying to swim. Uh, and bees don't swim too well. Though. So uh, you want to have those hives propped up and uh, I'm getting ready to put uh, a uh, mountaintop uh, feeder uh, either sugar or, or uh, I cook the sugar down and make it into a uh, candy board with uh, insulated top. So that's the main thing, insulate the top, uh, the sides and stuff. I do insulate the uh, west and uh, north and west side and just wrap it and leave the south and east open so they can get sun. So that's uh, some of the things I've been doing. It tends to work pretty good for me. So uh, that's about all that's going on here. Uh, not too much. Uh, so uh, I'll turn it back uh, to you uh, there, uh, Don. Am I still coming in or am I faded yep, out yep. again? You're still good. Um, <laughs> next up, we got Dennis. Go ahead, Dennis. OK. Uh, I don't use the Paramount anymore. But I'll say this, I'm a professional plumber. 
And I'll say, why well, go to the bee supply and buy a bunch of crumbled stuff? And every time I went to the urinal, I smelled the same thing. Go to Walmart if you're going to use it. <laughs> Get the unscented. It's the same thing in a urinal block you hang on a frame. And it costs you a dollar or 50 cents. <laughs> It'll last forever. So I knew that smell. I just went and checked on the chemical. I said, why well, pay that can of that expensive stuff when you can go to Walmart and buy a cheap one hang on a frame? <laughs> but I'm more in bees now than honey, but if you're going to use it, get the cheap one. It works, and it'll last most all winter. Do the bees pee on it? <laughs> no, I keep all females. They don't use the urinal. <laughs> <laughs> all right, That's all over, I got. <laughs> over to Todd. Go ahead, Todd. Uh, quick question, Don. Um, what's the difference between fructose and sucrose? And what's the advantage of using either one? And is the is one cheaper than the other? That's the, what I was going to answer with. You have to go with what is going to be your cheapest because you're going to have to feed bees. And I've used both. I've used dry sugar. I've used the fructose. I've used the corn syrup. And corn syrup has come a long ways since the 70s. Back in the early 70s, it was unstable. And we had more problems with it. But we use it. Oh, right now, we, we buy it by the tanker load. I mean, if you're going to get into bees in a big way, you're going to have to buy it from somebody or get a connection where you can get totes of it because you'll spend more time looking for it and driving than you should have it there. Yeah. Spend too much time mixing sugar. Oh, yeah. No, I know that. So it, it, basically, you're just saying it's a matter of price then. Both price, the... I haven't seen any difference and no ill effects on the bees. Okay. Um, the fructose, if you buy the lower grade, I think it goes 40 or 35, it'll seem to separate a little bit. The corn syrup, it's probably like a five to one. It, it's, it don't separate. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. It looks like the last question will be Matt Moss for tonight. Go ahead, Matt. Oh, since y'all talking about the uh, corn syrup and all, uh, I know you're talking about getting it from, from Man Lake or something, but where is the other places you might can find that? Well, where, whereabouts are you at? Uh, Mississippi, Tupelo. Uh, you probably could drive to Sugarland, Texas down there and, and uh, or go to Houston. I think I got two or three students that buy it over there in Houston. Uh, you can go to Cry, Louisiana was a place in Louisiana that was selling fructose. Okay. But they ain't, probably ain't nothing no closer, is it? Well, I don't know of any. Uh, maybe Dennis knew some up around uh, Missouri there. Uh, there used to be one out of Illinois there that was selling it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, they knew get on the internet and check sugar brokers or restaurant supplies or bottling companies. Yeah. Uh, you're going to have to buy enough of it or they ain't going to fool with you. It's the same thing with Savannah with the sugar company over there. If you're not a registered beekeeper, a commercial beekeeper, they're reluctant to sell you sugar bulk by the ton because there's moonshining is still thriving good and people are bootlegging yet. Yeah. Well, I'm sort of counting myself as a very, very small commercial <laughs> Beekeeper, <laughs> working my way up. Start there. Uh, Everybody, Everybody starts there. Uh, but I got one more question dealing with the bees. I had one queen left I didn't really have nothing to do with. So I grabbed me a frame of bees out of one hive and a frame of bees out of another hive because I've seen y'all do that. And all I do is start World War Three every time I do that. They try to kill each other out. Am I doing something wrong? Well, if you're going to take a, a frame from each two different hives, you need to spray them and, and keep the scent about the same, you know, even the scents out. Well, I got and smoked them real heavy. Thought that sometimes, would work. You know, sometimes that don't do enough. It all depends on, you know, the, the situation. But normally they won't fight. Uh, you might be having robbing and you think they're fighting. Because if well, there's no queen in there or no queen cell, they're more likely to start robbing on you real quick. Well, say 
Yeah, I got the fry. I got one frame and stuck in there, and got another frame stuck in there, and I started smoking them, and they started fighting each other right then. Mm -hmm. And I went back. You might have had a one of the frames. Do what? You might have had a clean on one of the frames. I don't think so. I hope not, but I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, but I got up there, and like I said, when it was all over with, I had a bomb in the box full of dead bees. But yeah. I still had Just, probably a frame, frame and a half of bees left, and there's probably a half a frame dead in the bottom. Yeah. Well, a lot of it depends on the time of the year. Yeah. Well, this was just the other day. <laughs> well, it's a learning just... curve. Everybody's learning. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's all I got. I think Dennis okay. had something to add to that. Dennis, go ahead. Um, he's asking about the corn syrup didant and uh, just above Quincy, Missouri. You can buy from didant on the corn syrup. And uh, your question on the bee frames, I hope they were brewed, not just bees. This time of year, they do kind of fight a little bit, but I just spray vanilla spray on them if I'm in doubt. I don't have too much problem with them early in the year, moving nurse bees, but the older bees, they're a little cantankerous <laughs> if you're trying to add them together, but that's all I got. Okay. All right, and that'll do it for tonight. Thank you, Don. Thank you, everyone. Uh, join us again in two weeks for October 31st. That'll be Halloween, so we are going to have a costume contest if anybody wants to dress up. Um, so, and join us for the after chat tonight. Thanks, Don. Thanks for showing up and putting up this bad internet. We'll see you in two weeks. All right, see you Good later. Night. <laughs>